So good evening, everyone, once again. Uh, welcome to day three, but I think it will be called session two because we had uh, we didn't we couldn't complete session one or day one. So uh, yesterday we had an excellent session of um, I think uh, I forgot the title. What's the what was the title? Uh, discovery of land. Uh, discovery of land. Yeah, discovery of land. And I think we nicely looked at um, the uh, evidence which can, which does really tend to support um, the nativity of our civilizations and possibly migration out of uh, Indian subcontinent outwards. So it was a it was actually a very enlightening uh, session. So let's let's learn more. And today's session is the cultural evolution. And um, yes, over to you, Gauri Shankar. Right, thank you very much. Oh, so in the last session, we have uh, looked at discovery of land, which is more anthropological, genetic, and historical uh, study, which uh, aims at understanding where the, how the Indians or Bharatiyas has evolved and, uh, and nativity of it. In today's session, we will look into the cultural evolution. This is more of sociological, a uh, bit of uh, psychological and a, um, and a scientific heritage of the cultures, how it evolved in India. So, and uh, also we would uh, look into the breaking misconceptions which exist in the present society. So let us start now. So when we see a person, we analyze the person and we call them as a personality. If a one person's behavior, we call as a personality. If we have multiple people living in one area, we call them as a culture. A behavior of a certain society is termed as a culture, whereas the behavior of a one person is personality. So, so the culture is nothing but a personality of a society. So the aim of today's study is to understand what is culture, how it evolves, how it shapes our lives, how culture provides a purpose and meaning to our existence, and also how culture encapsules our curiosity, knowledge, and technology. So this is the main study. So let us understand what culture means. The culture is derived from a Latin word called cultura, which means to inhabit a certain place or cultivate a certain place. The modern definition what we get is culture indicates the totality of human mode of life as much in as much as it is human. So everything deals with the human, we call it as a culture. So this definition is very loose and that gives to a lot of misconception and misunderstandings. For example, generally when we use term culture, we tend to link the word culture with the language of specific people, religion of specific people, food habits of such people, architecture of the homes or their place of worship, of their arts, and so on. With their dance forms, the clothing they wear and customs and, and celebrations they do. So this is how we loosely use the word culture means. So when we look at these kind of symbols, for example, say a Samskutam or Devanagdi script, symbol like Om, vegetarian food, a temple architecture like this, a uh, clothing, uh, uh, clothing like this, and the praying, we immediately, everyone say this is Hindu culture. Similarly, if we see a uh, uh, Urdu script and the meat eating and the symbols like this, we associate it with a Islamic culture. Similarly, if you see English cross and this wine and bread and uh, coats and suits, and we see uh, a church, 
we call it as a western culture or christian culture so the word culture is being loosely used in this fashion my proposition is and uh, it says that this is very narrow and constructed view to define a group of people and their culture in this in this fashion this is mainly raised because of the post colonial experience the whole uh, whole of the world across the world and uh, and during this time after 1950s a emergence of a new global, global culture has emerged this new global culture because of the uh, colonization across the world have has faith in only in european science that means western science is the uh, benchmark that whether you can call it scientific or not an emergence of a common language which is english and uh, the another faith or the another uh, cultural norm which came is cultural neutrality that means you should not boast where you come from you should be behave as if you're a global citizen you should not uh, talk about heritage and uh, your your uh, roots the another common um, notion came is the universal formal education and the utilitarian economy came into the society so these all form a kind of a global culture wherever we go in the world we see these kind of features so this led to uh, how this this happened in the across the world first is uh, because of the forced schooling i would call it forced schooling because uh, the across the globe it is considered as only way to school so you can see uh, the portions in the green have 100% of children going to schools that means structured classrooms where children go and sit and they learn what is been prescribed by the state or the teachers and the rest of this is kind of uh, not well uh, the all children don't go to school don't go to school even if they do they come come out of the school very early so the whole of this uh, uh, indian subcontinent arabia and africa and lat parts of latin america form in this pattern the second is homogeneity of language that means after 1950s it is considered you are educated if only you speak english so the demand to speak english has raised across the world so uh, we can see that in the whole of uh, if you see the total number of english speaking population across the world uh, by population yes us has dominant people because uh, the 300 450 million people or 300 million people speaks english as a language but if you see who are the next most populated english speaking people across the world is india pakistan and in the line you can see bangladesh which is the former india so the whole of indian subcontinent speaks english fluently and in large numbers and if you if you add up those it outrates uh, 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 it it takes over of the all other countries as the most english speaking people so technically we can say the english language is surviving because of indian subcontinent people who are speaking fluently and using it in the business so this uh, global culture uh, uh, came with this faith system okay so this is the become a global culture but uh, it doesn't actually says what the culture is it is talking in periphery so we have to understand what actually the culture means so the culture has something more to it the culture provides a unique perspective at looking at the world culture also shapes the way you see the world culture is kind of a uh, computer algorithm biological algorithm or wiring in the mind which shaped by the historical political social and cultural context in which the person lives in grows in that environment teaches the culture to the person 
So in a way, we can say the culture of an organism is like a biological evolution at the personal level. So it's like an evolution happening. That means the changes are happening, but at a personal level. So that's what the totally the total uh, definition or the scope of culture, definition of culture goes further. So for, to give an example, I will show this small clip of the lions, depiction of lions from various world cultures. Uh, just bear with me a second. So this shows different cultures, a depiction of uh, cultures. This is from Africa, from Japan, from India, from Turkey, from Iraq, and so on. So you have probably seen a various uh, feature of lions. Each culture uniquely captures what the lion means to them. For example, this Astane people from Ghana of Africa saw the lion like this. Japanese people who never seen a lion, lion doesn't exist in Japan or even in China, East Asia, it only lives from Central Asia, it used to live from the Central Asia, India, and further to the Europe. It never lived east of Asia, but uh, the stories went to them. There is a ferocious animal, uh, which has a mane, and it looks like that, and they have captured a imagery. So this is from Japan. This is from India. This is from Iraq and Turkey, which you, in the past times, Lions used to roam in, uh, in France, in, in Greece, in uh, Europe. So this is in, from Japan, uh, for, this is from Indonesia, this is from Taiwan, and so on. So you can see here clearly, each culture uniquely captures the animal, though the actual form of a lion looks like this. So from this, we can, say, we can conclude that each civilization or each culture captures something real in its own fashion, in its own way. That's what the culture means that I'm alluding to. Now we know uh, there are various culture, uh, civilizations existed across the world. Now the question comes, the, the play of uh, terms, for example, civilization and culture. Is the civilization and culture the same or different? So to understand that, we have to understand these aspects, as we have just seen, that each culture has its own fashion of viewing things. So for example, say there are five cultures here, different cultures. They have different ritual practices, customs and practices, and, uh, uh, and they see the world in their own unique way, all right? So, but they evolve, for example, if they, all these five cultures evolved in one geographical area, they share something because of the intermixing and that shared uh, common beliefs of different cultures comes under the umbrella of civilization. So each culture contributes to the notion of what civilization means. For example, when you talk about 
Western civilization whose main belief uh, is material culture and individualism. We can see different culture, for example, European cultures, Australian culture, Canadian culture, and American culture all have different, uh, live in different cultures. They have different rituals, different way of doing this. Even, if, even though they speak English, it's a little different. We see the different accents, but it comes under the Western civilization. Similarly, it's true for India and other parts, uh, for example, North American cultures. And for India, for example, we have different languages, different way we eat our food, different habits, different customs but we all call as Bharatiya civilization, Bharatiya Sadachara or Indian civilization. So this is differentiate between culture and civilization. Now I would move to how this culture emerges. So we know culture emerges in a society. The society is nothing but a uh, or population of a uh, uh, people in certain area say uh, long back, okay, there are some peoples came together and the increased in population at a certain area. So due to the temperaments of the people, the slowly diffusion and mobility step happens. That means certain people like to have friends with some kind of people and some don't. So that creates a kind of a polarity. That means there is shift in the diffusion and mobility happens, how the relations set up. Over the period of time, different tastes, interests, and habits makes different group of people. That is true even today in our classrooms or in the workplace. Uh, certain kind of people with the same kind of taste, interests, and habits come together more often than the other. And if that happens in a geographical area with a large number of population over the period of time, it creates something called cultural ensembles. That means certain group of people have distinct and unique way of expressing themselves, the behavior of certain people. And over the period of time, it precipitates into the cultural identity. So they are still fluid, but they have a cultural identity. So this thing happens and that's how the culture evolves over the period of time. So now another play of word uh, the general uh, the discourse in public discourse today goes is they often use the word culture and religion and mix them up as if they are both as synonymous. But the truth is, does they have does having different culture means they have different religion? So that's a big confusion. So religion, we have to understand what the religion is and the culture is. Religion is generally ascribed to a certain ideology. If you believe in the ideology, then only you're part of this religion. And religion, organized religion, it always demands a homogeneity. One kind of food, one kind of habit, say uh, certain principles you have to follow and you have to do these rituals. And if you don't follow, you do not belong to that religion. Third is generally organized religions are always a political order. They have a political agenda behind it. And when the group of people uh, of organized religion come together, they always make it into a state policy. That means any country has to be of that certain religion and there is no place for others. That's the behavior of the religious groups. And the, in the same way, the how we can understand religion is it's same like how we see the international boundaries today international but we have different countries similarly religions see themselves as a international boundaries they don't uh, respect the current geographical political boundaries they have a different way of looking uh, boundaries for example people talk about muslim uh, brotherhood or Christian uh, civilization. So they help each other across the political borders. So this confusion between religion and culture is created. And the words such as religion, culture, civilization, and race are commonly used synonymously and commonly misunderstood. The point is long back, that means before 18th century, it is always believed that religion exerts 
certain customs and uh, external observance that become a culture. Okay, so historically, the religion is seen as an aspect of a particular culture. For example, we say desert cultures or, uh, or, or, or Middle Eastern cultures created Abrahamic religion. Okay, so the conditions, environment, behavior of that people created a certain kind of religions. For example, Judaism or Christianity or Islam. So the culture of that place creates religions, not other way around. In 18th century, Western scholars purposefully started using these words interchangeably. Culture is equal to religion and religion equal to culture. And slowly in 19th century, European scholars opinionated and made it a concrete uh, hallmark that culture comes because of the religion. Culture is a product on hallmark of a particular religion. That's why when we talk about Islam, they, we talk about Islamic culture. We don't call about the, we don't think about the, the parent culture which created this Islam or Christianity. So that's the confusion. So uh, the another way of looking at culture is this. We know from long back, say 10,000 BC till 15th century, that India exerted its cultural influence over most part of the world, uh, most part of the habitated world. For example, from Syria in, uh, in West to the whole of Indonesia. So this is the influence of Indian culture. India never, uh, Indian people never conquered any land or, uh, or uh, oppressed any people. Due to the just um, the trade routes and the affiliation and the liking of the people, the native people of different land, for example, Cambodia, Laos, or, or, or Vietnam, has accepted Indian way or Indian culture. And they still live the way uh, 1500 years ago, uh, people used to live. So we can still see some of the pockets here and there everywhere, which follows the Indian culture. After uh, the colonization, we can see the whole world kind of now believes in a Western culture, the way we dress, where we choose to eat, where we talk, what happens at the workplace, what is considered as good, the etiquette of eating with spoons and forks. So all this Western culture has influenced most of the world without uh, uh, demanding from people. Okay, so that's how the culture of one place influences the other places. So now we understood what the civilization is, what culture is, what is religion is and culture is. We have seen the differences. Now is religious understanding or theology, what we call technically, is same as the cultural knowledge because every culture has its own knowledge. The way we speak, the language, the, the, the knowledge of, uh, of certain events, knowledge of uh, certain type of food availability in certain season, all that is cultural knowledge. So is the theology and cultural knowledge similar? Because in the textbooks and in the, in the general uh, discourse, we tend to hear religion and culture in a interchangeable fashion. So as I just said, the theology uh, or religious theology is a story, is an imaginative story and a belief which has no scientific background to it, all right? But the cultural knowledge of a place, cultural knowledge and the heritage of a place, it is a scientific experiences gathered over the generations about, it could be about herbs, it could be about languages, it could be about navigation through stars, it can be anything, which is a cultural knowledge. So if the cultural knowledge is scientific, it is same as a modern Western knowledge. The answer is no. Cultural knowledge, which is scientific in temperament, is not same as the current accepted Western science across the modern science, what we call. The difference being is that the cultural knowledge which is scientific in essence, but it discharges its services through socio-ethical rituals and practices. 
I will explain that in further in further slides. Whereas Western mind mistakes culture and uh, religion are same. So what it does it what what the modern science does it it disregards everything which is cultural in realm as hoax and unscientific. Okay, so that is the biggest problem with the modern science. It disregards everything cultural, everything native. It only if it fits into this uh, Western model of scientific method, then only it considers as a anything has to be scientific. So I would add a comment from 19th century by Swami Vivekananda on modern science. He said, after demolishing and humiliating of religious and cultural authorities, the West came up with a new idea of scientific materialism. What he said was, the worship of scientific materialism was safely conducted by the modern priests of science. So he tried to indicate that science also became like an organized religion. It has its own principles, a way, and if you don't prescribe to it, you are outcasted. So that's what he tried to uh, indicate. Now, we have seen different words like culture, religion, civilization, and all that. So over a period of time, say from last 5,000 years ago from till, till now, how the world order has shifted. In, in primitive societies, say 10,000, 15,000 years ago, there were different cultures lived in different geographical uh, uh, areas. And each culture has their own traditional scientific knowledge, their experiences, and, uh, and everything what to do with their culture. Over a period of time, say, uh, sorry, Around 500 BC, when the Greco-Roman uh, uh, the empire started, they created their own kind of religion to it, a system to it. And the systems to expand, they have encompassed all the cultures in that geographic area. So the religion became a order, world order system, mainly in political nature, uh, and cover the area. So the same, uh, uh, the Greek uh, political order, which is a Greek religion, Roman political order, which is a uh, Roman religion, and similarly, Christian religion, which is a Christian political order. So that's how it uh, started um, expanding its uh, territories. Taking, uh, taking different cultures into its uh, wings and normalizing all the cultures. You know, uh, for example, four different cultures and have four different views on the same things, then they may fight with each other and that is politically unstable. So what it came with us is a theology, which means a story, a imaginative story, which has to be fed to all different cultures and told them to be homogenized. That means believe in same thing. So the cultural, so the culture which is evolved out of an organic evolution, uh, which is symbiotic to the environment, has turned into a religion, which is a emerged as a political order to neutralize cultural differences of different people, having strict discipline and so on. So now, after 18th century, after the industrial revolution a new tool came, which is a modern science. What it modern science does is it has ability to create tools, powerful tools to exploit the nature, the way we want it. If we desire something, we can get out of it. If we need diamonds, we can, we can dig the, the uh, we dig the land and we can get a sto uh, stones and polish it and we get a diamonds. If we need wood, we have we can cut the forest much faster rate than any any time in the in the in the past. So it is the ability to create tools for the for the utilitarian end by exploiting nature uses this scientific method to stabilize that we created a uh, an economy which is which guides the modern econ modern science. If there is a if there is a if there is a rich man who wants to spend money to travel to Mars, he puts a huge amount of money and all scientists 
go there to create uh, a space vehicle for Mars, for example, what's happening in the case of Tesla. So this happened because of there is a change in the education system. The indigenous education system across the world, they, they are very local, non exploitative and the native education system always concerns about its own growth. It wants to support everyone in that particular culture. But the Western education system believes in uh, opportunity, uh, giving skills and making them as a part of a money-making opportunity or a part of an industrialization. So this transition happened after industrial revolution that is in 18th century. So because the most of the world believes in uh, the universal form of education, Western science, Western uh, model of economy, the Western education system is also part of it. And that has led to the destabilization of the world by exploiting the uh, degrading in air, in water, in soil, and so on, and collapsing the ecosystems, which is highly invasive which was not the case in the indigenous education systems across the world. So what cultural knowledge uh, uh, encompass, what the cultural knowledge means, we said it is scientific somehow, and uh, what does it talk about? What realms it deals with? So the culture is a treasure house, which shows the societal personal knowledge with the knowledge, with the nature and its uh, principles. So, Culture generally imparts education for the, to the children. It also imparts medical knowledge, where to find herbs of certain for the certain elements. The building techniques, how to build a house in that particular uh, environment. If it's, if it's arid condition, no rains, the houses will be of one kind. If it's like a place like Chirapunji or Nagaland, people build the houses differently there. That has a native culture influence on it the structural knowledge of various materials, the understanding of seasons uh, and agricultural practices. It, uh, the culture gives uh, a unique way to study the, the, the science of uh, astronomy and uh, habits of food gathering, which food to gather at what time. So that is also a part of a culture. Culture also teaches what kind of dangers and calamities happen through the stories, what it remembers. And the culture also speak, uh, provides a, a interaction between human and nature with the trees. And, uh, and uh, it also, cultures also have give, given major significance in studying the, in, in including the mountains, seas, lakes as a personal beings, for example, forest. In India, we have a uh, uh, tradition of forest looking as a being protected by the some goddess, some uh, forest goddess. So something like that. And uh, culture also has philosophies included in it. So it so cultural knowledge deals with all these areas. Okay, so we know there are fifty civilizations before uh, before Indian civil uh, along with Indian civilization. But the Indian civilization is the only one which has the unbroken continuity from antiquity till present times. Okay, so how I will prove that in the next session that we'll do tomorrow in the in the the, the, the spiritual the rays of spiritualism, I will deal that in in that portion. So this continuity helped us in in preserving what we consider the dear and it always stabilizes the, uh, the environment around us. For example, you will be surprised, and you probably know, but you will be surprised to notice again that India is the most populated country in the world today. And the biggest animals on the planet lives in India. For example, elephants thrive in India, tigers thriving in India, Asian lions thriving in India, Rhinoceros thriving in India, all right. So and and the, and the leopards and other other animals thriving in India. 
even though there is just so much demand for land, so much demand for resources, but still the Indian people are living and, and wildlife as well as people are thriving together, which is unseen anywhere in the world. For example, America, which is three times or two times, 2.5 times of India, United States, for example, it has uh, decimated is the wild buffalo population. They killed everyone, everything. Now they have in Yellowstone National Park in America, they get, they got uh, uh, the Canadian buffaloes, American buffaloes from Canada and they, are, and they are raising them there. So all the prairies and the devastation of the, uh, and another extension stories of uh, passenger pigeons. Uh, it is said that passenger pigeons, when they used to flow through the uh, plains of America, the, they couldn't even used to see the sun. But in the span of 50, 100 years, they got extinct. So the, 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 the living together with the nature is uniquely Indian and deals with the Indian culture, which is even true today. So we can conclude there is uh, uh, the, the Indian culture survived because of its education system, which kept the Indian story. The every generation taught their children their culture in a much better day, in much better way than the other cultures. And that has led to uh, unbroken continuity from long time. Now the claim came, claim comes that uh, the, the so-called universities are the first developed in Europe. For example, Oxford University in 11th century. Before that, there was no universities. So even today it has been taught and uh, said as, uh, the England or the on the West did the, did it first. So, if the Indian culture is preserving from the uh, from from the antiquity, there must be some kind of education system. And universities did existed, but we don't find them in our textbooks or in uh, general uh, discourse. So, were there any universities for Indian people? The answer is yes. The archaeological and literally evidences clearly show we had a grand university at Takshashila, which is in uh, present uh, Pakistan in Rawalpindi. Now uh, we have uh, Nalanda University from Bihar, Vikramashila from Bihar, Vallabhi University from Gujarat, and uh, Pusha, Pushpagari and uh, Odhanapuri, Somapura, and Nagarjun Kanda from Andhra Pradesh, and various other uh, universities. Uh, across the west coast also, Sayadri and other areas. So this is just to give a, this is a major, major universities. That means 10,000 students, 15,000 students go and learn at one place. In addition to this, we have a Gurukula system. That means every village had a teacher and he is, he used to teach the students. So there was a tremendous education uh, process was happening. So what is the difference between the current education system and the education system which existed in India way back? The Indian education system always emphasized that knowledge was too sacred uh, to be bartered for money. So education is something and it never used to be bartered for the money. And uh, it, means it, we, it has been uh, found that uh, examinations, as, as of today, we, we, have, we pass examinations to go from one grade to another. But in India, examinations were considered as superfluous and they were never part of a completion of one study. So there were no degrees awarded. So teacher or the guru is the one who certifies whether the education of a certain um, child has finished or not. It is his own duty and, he, and uh, that's how it used to be done. And using knowledge for uh, earning a living or for any selfish ends was considered as uh, is drastic or a really bad thing, or scurrilous. So what happened to these universities? So uh, with the invention of, uh, uh, invasion of uh, various kings uh, from the Middle East, has completely destroyed these universities. For example, Takshashila was firstly uh, attacked by the Darus, a Persian king around 500, 500 BC. 
then in 500 AD, after a thousand years, completely destroyed by Huns. Similarly, the Nalanda University, which existed till 12th century, was uh, burnt by some uh, Muslim fellow, Muslim king, and it's been said that the, bur the, bur the library was in flames for three months. So that much material was burnt. And, and uh, the, the, all, the king, uh, all the teachers were there, approximately 10,000 teachers uh, were there. They weren't being butchered. And uh, the, the students were killed and they were driven out and everything was destroyed. That level of destruction uh, this land has seen. And according to the, the historian DC Ahil, he said the destruction of these centers, uh, uh, centers of learning at Nalanda and other places across Northern India was responsible for the dismiss of ancient scientific thought in mathematics, astronomy, alchemy, and anatomy. So how did uh, it survived? Even now we know of uh, Vedas and uh, or Itihasas and Puranas, how it survived. It survived because of the decentralized nature of our Indian education. And the, the ingenuity of keeping the knowledge in household. Every household has a certain harbor of that ancient uh, scientific knowledge of that legacy. So, and the southern part of India, for example, uh, the Kerala and Tamil, the, uh, Tamil Nadu was, didn't get affected till recently of outside influence. So they preserve the original thought of Indian ethos. And uh, the most of the ancient knowledge survived due to the oral tradition. So though they burned the universities, destroyed the universities and burned the libraries, but the, they couldn't take the oral tradition from the people's memory. So around for the, for around 1200, uh, 12th century, the universities across India were destroyed. Re the gurus were being killed, the students are driven out, and the, the institution, learning institutions were uh, destroyed. But due to the oral traditions and the customs at home, that knowledge survived. Though it lost its scientific uh, glory, but it has uh, created a ritualistic traditions where we remember how our ancestors did, but we do not know why we do it. It has to do with the loss of those education, uh, education and research labs of those universities, which used to create these uh, customs were lost. So during the time we see uh, to compensate this loss after 12th century, various uh, gurus came what we call as bhakti, bhakti sons, they rekindled that spirit that our tradition was ancient and we, we are not what they experienced at that time. The, the tyranny and the destruction what they're experiencing at that time, they gave hope for the people that you, are, you are belong to an ancient civilization of great glory. So, that is the, uh, the contribution of all the bhakti saints uh, from, from Kashmir to the Tamil Nadu, we have various people which came across. So to encapsulate what we have learned today uh, is that a civilization uh, has a common core philosophy. Culture is a part of a civilization. Culture and religion are not same. Culture is independent of uh, theology and uh, the cultural knowledge is scientific in nature gathered over long period of time. Okay, so now I would, uh, this covers the major portion. Now I'll look into the specifically Indian culture and how uh, Indian culture uh, affects every, uh, every uh, realm of our lives. So first is language. Language uh, is what we consider the ancient languages is Sanskrit. Uh, Sanskrit is considered as the primordial conduct of uh, life consciousness with the human thought. That means there is no other language that fluid and vocabularly so rich 
that if a heart, if or if we feel something in our heart, we can express that perfectly without losing any meaning in Sanskrit. So it is perfected in such way. And the Sanskrit language and it's all its alphabets are the most possible distinct sounds that our human anatomy of mouth can, mouth and nose can produce. Okay. So, uh, and you know this, uh, the lagu and the, uh, the dirgha, how we call ka, 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 ga, the, the, the aspirations and the unaspirate way of saying it. So this is the structure of our uh, language, which is true from Kashmir to Kanyakumari. Uh, so, and uh, the language has developed with the phonetics and around 3000 BC, uh, 300 BC, a great Rishi called Panini created a work called Astadhyaya. His work of Astadhyaya is based on his ancestors, what he heard, but he compiled in such a concise way that in a pages of 30 pages with 4,000 rules almost, you can describe the whole Sanskrit grammar in these 4,000 rules. Even today, it is a feat that no other language has created. And the Astadhyaya, the Paninist Astadhyaya is, is uh, uh, pivotal in creating what we use as a Google Translator. We use Google Translator from one language to another. So that happens based on the algorithms written based on the Paninist Astadhyaya. And uh, we call these uh, letters as Devanagari because uh, uh, the word Deva actually means prana, which is four seconds. That is a, a breath we take in four seconds. Okay. And the, from ka to ha or nya is a, a arrangement, which is called nagara. So these all are breaths or the sounds arranged in this way. That's why we call it as Devanagari. And there is the ancient formula with this Akshara Dharma. These are all, all called Aksharas. And this is Akshara Dharma. Based on this Akshara Dharma, there is a formula something like this, which gives the, the, the radius of the solar system. And interestingly, that is consistent with the current calculations did by this NASA fellow, NASA organization. So we, we know the, the, the Alpa Prana and Mahaprana, Ka, Ka, Ga, Ga, the, the way it has been arranged. Okay, this has led to the modern, even periodic table chemically. So, this is about the language of the Indian culture. The another interesting feat that no other culture has created is the, the, the marriage of mathematics and language together. Okay, we can say as lingo mathematical encrypt. Uh, cryptography. So the, our, uh, our ancestors uh, or the scientists like, like Aryabhatta, he created a number system called Aryabhattiya number system. Similarly, in Kerala, we find uh, Uh, Gauri Shankar, are you back? I think we lost your audio. All right, can you hear me now? Oh, you're back, right? Yes, can you hear me now? Yeah, 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 sure. All right, can you see the slides also? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, so Katapia, so 
so ingenuity of the Adyabhatta system is each swar has a exponent of 10 arranged in this fashion and the and the yara lava has 30 40 and numbers given in this fashion and the varga the vyanjan part of it has given a, a numbers like this so what it does is if you want to write any huge number you can just write as key key just means 1 into 10 power of 2 or k means 2 into 10 power of 12 or or if you write a huge number like uh, say uh, 10 to the power of 14 or 16 you just write it as g all right so that's the ingenuity of uh, aryabhatta system which gives fluidity in using the number any huge numbers similarly the the technique which developed in southern part of india which is Katapayadi system, which is used in uh, Indian classical music in Melakarta in, in, in the finding the ragas, which is called Melakarta system. So here the arrangement is a little different from Kakha Gagha Nya and Cha 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 Cha. It, the numbers are given this way, but all the Ka Ta Pa Ya all has number one. Ka Ta Fa Ra all has two, and similarly the numbers are assigned this way. So interesting part is there is a huge gymnastics happened with this. For example, there is a sloka like this. I won't go into it. It has a meaning to it. A beautiful meaning comes out of it. But if we decipher uh, this sloka with katapayadi system, what we uh, get is we get a pi, the value of pi accurate till the 11th digit. So it just goes on like this. So 3.141592, this is a pi number. So pi, the value of pi, the mathematical pi is encrypted in the shloka like this so that people won't number, won't forget the sequence of it. So that's a, a unique ingenuity of the Indian scientists. And, and uh, the story of uh, evolution that we see in Hindu story is Dashavatara. It is uh, from the current facts, uh, the, the, from the biology, and uh, we know that the life has originated in oceans, then uh, land animals came, then a, a, a ecosystems developed where the predator and prey existed and uh, amphibians. Uh, so this story says the same thing. Machavatara, that means first organic life. Varaha, which means uh, land animals or herbivores. Then, uh, sorry, then Kurmavatara, which is adaptation of uh, life on earth, on the, on the land, amphibious life. Then Varaha, the land animals or herbivores. Then Narasimha, which is a predatory or carnivore uh, with a apex predictor uh, existed in the ecosystem. Then the story turns into human side. This is anthropological side. This is the evolutionary side of the life. This is anthropological side. Vamana represents a early, early hominids, uh, the primates, small primates. Then Pashurama, which represents the hunter and gatherers, food gatherers. Then Balarama, the first agricultural communities. Then Sri Rama, the first village leaders. Then there comes Krishna, who is a administrator as well as a diplomat. Then Buddha is a, a, a prosperous philosophical society, stable society. And the Kalki, which will uh, descend when the, when the world turned into a materialistic greed and when nature degrades. So this is how it has been portrayed, which is quite same with the evolutionary theory. Now, another interesting part is uh, choosing the uh, courtship, whom to marry. People have uh, uh, observed that in certain marriages, child born with certain defects. So the, so the, uh, the ancestral people, they have seen why this happening. There must be some reason. So how to choose a partner become a science. And we, and we followed that uh, and it, precipitated into something called Gotra system, which is nothing but a genetics uh, created during the 
ancient times or Vedic times, we can say. So Gotra system is a designation uh, designed to track down the Y chromosomal DNA, which is the male lineage, okay? So, uh, so when we say Gautam Buddha, Gautama Buddha, he belongs to a Gautama Gotra. Okay, that means he's a direct descendant of Gautama Rishi. So we, we need not to search who his forefathers are. Just by Gotra, we know. So which says the, the or ancestors or Rishis had, uh, had known there is a something genetic material flows from a parent to offsprings. Okay, and uh, if you see the statistics of a Down syndrome across the world, we see that the most of Asia and Africa, which are the native population across the world, they have the least Down syndrome prevalence. That means over the period of, uh, uh, it's a technical difference, prevalence, it is much less than rest of the world newly dominated world, for example, Latin America and North America and uh, Africa and rest of the Europe. So these cultures had something genetic, uh, the, the culturally they know something that the new cultures didn't know. So that's the end, uh, end of one part. And then I will go to few other aspects. For example, the concept of time. The concept of time in Indian context, there is a smallest unit of time ex expressed in our uh, science is truti, which is 0 0.031 microseconds. And to Mahakalpa, which is a huge number, 311 trillion years, okay? So this is mentioned in our Puranas, but the current science has estimated the age of universe just to be 13.7 billion years, okay? So where is 13.7 billion years and where 300 trillion years? Why our ancestors chose to have this wide range of time and what purpose it served them, we may never know because we lost the direct scientific connection with that. But there is something existed. So interestingly, the time, the upper limit of time is defined in Mahayugas, Manvantaras, Day of Brahma and Cycle of Brahma. So Day of Brahma is approximately 3.4.32 billion years, according to our Puranas. The current science have estimated the age of sun and earth and age of universe is around in the order of 10 power 17. So it is approximately Day of Brahma, okay? So that is an interesting uh, analog we find. And another interesting part is the division of time, of upper time. We see the yuga system. Uh, each Divya Yuga can, uh, separated into four yugas, Satya, Treta, Devapara, and Kali, and which is a part of 71 man, uh, Manvantaras. And the 17 Manvantaras is a day and night of a, a Brahma, a day of a Brahma, which is called Kalpa, and then full life of Brahma, which is 11 point, uh, three, 311 trillion years, which has various sections to it. So in, in, from Rig Veda, we see the Yuga system in different uh, uh, calendars. So the, these are the different names of Yugas. And this, the, we have seen the upper limit and the lower limit also comes to 10 power of seven, order of 10 power of seven called Truti. Then it goes on like Muhurta, what we use in, uh, in Puja and the Padhati. We use uh, Muhurta, we use uh, Nakshatra, we use Paksha, Masam. This is generally used, but they were, even these were used like Lava, Renu and Truti. The uses of that is being forgotten. So interesting point I would like to uh, connect is why they said it is 71 manvantaras, the, word, the uh, number 71, and why the yugas have 1.723 million years or something. These numbers are important, 4, uh, 432,000 years, 864, and so on. It is, it is found that the tachalugas, when you add up, like what I just said, 432, 
eight, six, four, and so on, it adds up like this to 12,000 years. This is according to one of the Puranas, which is if you add up 12,000 and the ascending and descending note of it adds up to 24,000 years, which is nothing but the precision of earth. Earth has a property to spin like a spinning top. It rotates around its own axis. It goes, revolves around the sun and it also spins around its axis, okay? The spinning of axis takes 26,000 years, okay? And in each and every 72 years, it moves one degree, okay? So from this 72, when you count one, two, three, four, five, how many, uh, uh, if you divide 26,000 uh, years, we come to the Manvantara 17 because it fits with the precision of the earth. So the, the number 71 comes from the precision of the earth, okay? So this is the interesting scientific connection. So is it just a pseudo scientific claims we're just making or there is a forgotten scientific knowledge behind this? The authoritative books do exist and uh, I'll finish in five, 10 minutes or five minutes. Just give me some time. So authoritative books did existed, for example, Surya Siddhanta and the Siddhanta Shiromani. Uh, and it gives the approximate diameters of each planet, the diameter of Mercury, Saturn, Mars, and so on, with an error of less than 1%. Okay, so this is, we're talking about before one millennia. Okay, one million, so beyond 12,000, uh, 12th century. All these calculations were made, okay? And the Arabhatiya, uh, written by Arabhatta at the age of 21, he, uh, he also calculated distance between sun and various planets, okay? So Mercury, these are the values of the Arabhatta and these are the modern values. If you see, they don't differ much, okay? So, how did they calculate? Did they knew mathematics? Of course, they knew mathematics. The, the, tignomet the roots of trigonometry, like sine and cos, which is in Sanskrit, we call it as jya and koti jya, comes from the, uh, comes from the Surya Siddhanta, okay? And the Siddhanta Shiromani talks about complex mathematics like differential calculus, algebra, and trigonometry. So all this was encrypted in uh, creating excellent calendars and that is still in present, we're using it. And the various calendar systems used across uh, Indian subcontinent and the rest of the Indian influenced area, for example, in Cambodia, Laos, Burma, like uh, Vikrama, uh, Vikrama calendar, Salivahana and Samwats, with different kind of Samwats. And how they calculate the calendars is based on not optical telescopes or, or scientific instruments. They made a, 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 based on architecture, they created all these calendars. For example, we see Jantar Mantar in Jaipur and Delhi, and it has various instruments like this. Based on these instruments, they have calculated the panchang. Even people used uh, wooden sticks and bamboos. For example, Samanta Chandrasekhar Mahapatro, he created a, last, we can say, Indian uh, astronomical text around 1890 called Siddhanta Darpan. He used just woods and uh, bamboos and he corrected the Indian calendars. We see in every temple that there is Navagraha Puja. There is the arrangement of nine planets with sun. And this is not, uh, this is a heliocentric, we can see. The sun is at the center and all planets are around it. Okay, that which the Europe lent in 16th century. And we use that and we know that from thousands of years back. And even the rituals, uh, we see after the marriage, there is a tradition, especially in South of India, to uh, see the stars of Vashishta and Arundhati. And it is symbolized as a ideal couple should live like Vashishta and Arundhati which symbolizes the marital fulfillment and loyalty to each other. But scientifically, why they do so? 
somehow our Indian rishis knew that double star systems exist. That means uh, this is the Arsa major, Big Dipper. Within normal eye, we cannot make it is as a two stars. But if you look at the telescopes, even with the uh, normal binoculars, you can see it made up of two different stars. Okay. And uh, out of all these kind of uh, double star systems uh, observed, Arundhati and Vashista are uh, unique because generally double star systems, one is big and one is small. And the smaller one always rotates around the bigger one. But in case of Arundhati and Vashista, they are for equal mass and they rotate around their center of mass. Okay, so that is, um, that is to say, that human life is a universal phenomena and the respect of male and female part in the system of marriage. So that deep understanding and the rituals do exist in our, in our culture. And there is another misconception that Bharatiyas are aloof loop, that they never knew anything and they always lived in India, which is completely false. The, Pur the Puranic geography, for example, uh, the geography in Ramayana, talks about Jambu Dvipa and various other lokas, okay? And it talks about sea of salt, blood, milk, uh, and so on. Similarly, the, the world geography in Mahabharata is, is rotated around Meru. It, there is a Meru, there is a Varsha, there is a, and Bharata Varsha is very at the bottom near the salt ocean. There is a Himalayas then come, then this, all this mentioning is there in our uh, Puranic text. And there is a Uttarkuru, Jambudvipa, Ketu, Ketu Mala, Bhadravarsha, and so on. These names are, do exist. So the scholars uh, thought, is it just uh, hypothetical names or there is a real geography exist in it? So there were some educated guesses. And, uh, and they made educated guesses like this. So this portion is Jambudvipa, this is Karunchika, this is Plaksha, this is Kusha, and this is uh, Sal Salmali Dvipa, and this is Saka Dvipa, and this is Pushkara Dvipa. And these are the educated guesses. And, uh, and when we look with the, the current satellite pictures, and they turn to be exactly same features they are describing in our Puranas. And this research was done by a professor from Pune, Esam Ali, and he read the Puranas and uh, he, was a, he was a geography a geologist. He, and he said, all this Puranas talk about, it may not give the satellite picture, but exactly describing the places, tribes, flora, and fauna unmistakably of different part of the world. So without going to those places or, or ancestors going to those places, you cannot know the geography. Even the, even the Mahabharata talks about after Hindu Kush, this is Hindu Kush region in the, in the, in the part of uh, frontier part of uh, Pakistan, the fire, worship, fire worshipers live, which is Jurastrians, which is unmistakably true. Okay, this is Hindu Kush. And this region, this is Himalayas, this is uh, Tajikistan, and here this whole area was dominated by fire worshippers. Okay, so this is another northern lands shows about the Ural Mountains, Aerial Sea, and this is the Meru is somewhere here, and it talks about different mountain ranges, which is exactly we find in the world map. And within India too, there is a massive description in Mahabharata and um, Ramayana. And we can even see the ancient names. For example, we can even see uh, the Simanchalam, which is used here, the Mount Everest, which is Gauri Shankara, which is in our text, and uh, so many names, familiar names we can come across. This is Janapadas uh, and the names of the towns, which you can, uh, if you read them, you will... Uh, no, quite familiar. In medicine, the authority texts like Charaka Samhita and Sushruta Samhita do exist in, and the formal system of uh, treating illnesses as a form of Ayurveda did exist in India. And the Sushruta Samhita, uh, Samhita talks about approximately 11, uh, 1100 illnesses 
and 700 different medicinal plants to treat them. And uh, it has different sources how to create these uh, medicines from uh, mineral source to animal sources. So there is a huge uh, um, uh, science did exist. Here, the point is the, the education, the Western education, and there is a difference in Indian education, Western education system, mainly to employ people so that they can have part of an industrial revolution. Indians modified it that you have to know English, then you're educated, and that leads to employment. So uh, there is something more. Shall I continue or just stop? I'm uh, taking up much time. I think, uh, yeah, how much time do you think you will need? Perhaps it's a good idea to stop. Yeah. And uh, we can always kind of continue tomorrow. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, at the end point, I will just want to say, uh, I was talking about uh, the uh, various aspects of it. We can talk about sometime later too. I think that Dr. Uh, Gauri Shankar, such valuable information. Yeah. There's no need to rush through and finish it off. Okay. Even if it extends for a day or two, uh, which seems like- I, I, I Perhaps I, I probably need uh, five, five to seven minutes more just to complete it. Okay, it's up to you. Um, is it five five minutes is okay? I'll just try to finish. Just few slides, two, three slides that exist. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sure. All right. So uh, so the Indian education system, uh, the Indians modified it that you have to be English educated, then only you're educated, and that leads to employment. So that the whole purpose of education is just turned into finding an employment and uh, getting into economic debt traps. But uh, if you see the Indian approach, it is much different than the present current uh, approach of the world, education approach of the world, uh, which is in uh, popularity. The Indian education system always emphasized that the, it defined who is educated. Educated means one who is enlightened. And uh, the hallmark of an educated person is his highly dignified and well-lived life not in material sense, but in experience and in emotional sense. So there is a, just quote by, there is a uh, professor, uh, L.P. Jacks, he just uh, said this uh, few words. It captures what uh, knowledge means, education system means. It's, it says that the master in arts of, uh, art of living draws no sharp distinction between his work and play. The pursuit, uh, he simply, a person simply pursues his vision of excellence through whatever he's doing. And that becomes, uh, there is no distinction between his work and play. So it merges into one. So similarly, the science, the social, uh, so sociology, the everything comes one, uh, one as a culture. So why we lost this culture uh, and the continuity from our ancestors is because of the uh, European mischief happened after missionaries and uh, British imperialism came into India. So around 1800 to 1820, the French and uh, English missionaries started using the word called Hindu conquest. And they started using the word called caste from their European lenses. So they always saw that the invaders as a superior caste and the Aboriginal natives are Sudras and Pareas, which led to the Aryan invasion theory, which we discussed yesterday, which I, which, uh, with scientific evidences, I refuted it or claimed uh, as proved it as falsified. So these are the references of this Hindu conquest liter literature. So when we talk about Varna system, we immediately recognize it as a caste system, which is completely wrong. The English word caste comes from Spain and Portuguese term, which means race, lineage, or breed, okay? And it is socially stratified in Europe, but our, but our ancient scripts talked about Varnas as equal, uh, equal in status, all right? So Varna system is actually an economic blueprint in our scriptures, how it's been talked. It's not about sociology, it's about economics. 
Okay, that's the distinction we have to make. And after uh, 1784, when the Western education was imposed on Indian population, creating schools and uh, colleges in Delhi, uh, Mumbai, Chennai, Calcutta, Pune, and various other parts of the world, uh, of, of the country, we really see the decline of uh, India in economy. So what they did is from the, from the ancient existing equal system, the Westerners said it is as a, turned into as a hierarchical system where they put the Brahmins at the first and they created a new world called Paraya, which at current times turned into Dalits. And uh, this is how they stratify the Indian society, which is completely untrue. So how it affected is, this is the economy of the world, uh, a study done by a great economist called Angus Madison, and they created, uh, published his work in 2003. So this shows the economy of the world in percentage of GDP of four major uh, economies, US, China, Europe, and India. So if you see till 16th century, or 17th century, India always had a richest in the world. That's why everyone wanted to come to India and find a route to India so that they can get the part of the rich. Uh, slowly, what happened is you can clearly see after 1700, something happened and the economy started falling drastically. This is where the Western education system was introduced in India. The idea of caste and separation of people was imposed on people through the education system, which led to uh, discord in the Indian society, which helped uh, the foreigners to prey on India and loot India in the way by dividing people with each other, by creating divisions. This is the similar uh, 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 chart from 1st AD to 2005, which shows how the Indian uh, uh, economy has fallen. I would like to uh, give a proof from Manusmriti. Manusmriti talks about uh, the Purusha Sutra of, from Rig Veda talks about various class of people. For example, Brahmanas, as it describes, came from mouth, Kshatriyas from his bahus or shoulders, Vaishyas from his thighs, and Shudras from his feet. It is not to uh, degrade or, or to uh, uh, put a stamp as a supremist, but it talks in an equal fashion based on its uh, division of labor. Manusmriti talks as the navel is a center to balance the body, top and bottom. That means whenever a, a, uh, the balance is broken, the economy or the system will collapse. So the story of Ramayana, uh, the, there are different thousands of versions of Ramayana exist, different rishis wrote in different way. One of the versions talks like this, that Rama always addressed Ravana as Mahabrahman because of his credentials. Then, so, and uh, Ravana is represented as a highly developed materialistic society. And, and whenever uh, Lanka is described, it's described as a Swarna Lanka. And Rama represents a knowledge-based society. To kill Ravana, he just cannot kill. If he cuts his head, it comes back again. So he gets a clue from his uh, Ravana's brother Vibhishana that you have to hit to his navel to destabilize or kill him. So, uh, so therefore the Rama does the same and Ravana gets killed. So the moral of the story is it comes directly links to the uh, Manusmriti, which says that the material society collapses when the economy gets collapsed. So Indian culture gives a unique insight into various aspects of life, for example, linguistics, uh, life sciences, mathematics, uh, geography, education philosophy, as well as economic, socioeconomic divisions. So, uh, so the summary is the spiritually advanced cultures were not ignorant of principles of mathematics and science, but they saw no necessity to explore those principles Beyond that, uh, beyond that which it helps in the advancement of harmonious perfection. That means no destruction of nature for the greed of your own. So in that way, the Indian philosophy has uh, evolved and Indian culture represents. 
So for the Bharatiya society, uh, end words are Bharatiya society can only achieve its glory uh, and flourishes when we nurture in our own cultural roots by implanting foreign roots in our place will not lead us or uh, help us in developing further. With this, I end. Thank you very much. Right. So thanks a lot once again for an exciting uh, session, Gauri Shankar. Thanks. Um, very valuable. In fact, I was just wondering how good it will be to engage a lot of our youngsters uh, so that um, they get to hear uh, the, the symbolic and the Eastern perspective of looking at uh, life. Because the last few slides, especially where we spoke about um, Ravana's navel and uh, yeah. there is symbolism there. And um, it's all intertwined in our way of uh, storytelling as well. So sometimes when it is called mythical, yeah, difficult to say whether the symbolism actually helps us unlock a lot of secrets hidden within that. True. And, um, yeah, it's fascinating. I think um, special thanks to you for all the effort to nicely stitch together the slides. And uh, it's, almost, it, it's almost poetic, I must say. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the effort. So lots more, uh, I can see the, uh, I can see a lot of work coming from this, hopefully. So yes, questions, please. Anyone uh, has any questions, please raise your hands. And uh, um, maybe in the meantime, I'll just ask one question, uh, Gauri Shankar. Yeah, yeah sure. Be, with regards to the um, the Deva, Deva, Deva Bhasha, I think yeah. uh, uh, very nicely kind of uh, highlighted that Deva doesn't necessarily refer to the um, gods or the demigods. It's actually yes. more of, uh, um, I, can't, I can't get the word for it. Perhaps you can just kindly explain a little bit again so that it's clearer for us to understand. It's an important point because when we talk of Deva Bhasha, we immediately talk or consider it to be spoken by the Indras and the <clears throat> Apsaras and so on. Yes. <laughs> Uh, basically, Deva means in, in, in Puranic sense, it just means energy, prana. The prana in us, the, the atma, which is the inner core uh, lotus, which uh, runs the body, which gives the consciousness to the body, that gives, uh, which takes the energy from the sources around us, and that energy comes out through our uh, vocal uh, uh, apparatus, and that becomes a prana. So generally we have 16, uh, the inhalation and exhalation per minute. So the each prana is defined as a four second some unit. So this, when we say, we, when we uh, uh, express any uh, or pronounce any letter, it approximately takes, uh, they say four seconds. Okay, so in, 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 in the structure, uh, when it is was made. So the way the slokas are recited and where the way the memory of slokas exist in oral tradition. So the each letter should given a prana of four seconds. So that's how the word deva came from because it, it is originated from the lotus or the atma itself, which represents Satchitananda or Brahma or Vishnu. From that Vishnu comes from Vishnu Saraswati comes, which in the form of Sharada and uh, Saraswati, that ends as a form of sound. So that's the connection. All right. Thank, thanks a lot. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, Kumar um, joined today. Uh, Kumar, yes, please go ahead. Perhaps you yeah, can the question, yourself. It's yeah, the, nice to kind of uh, know each other. Yeah. <laughs> video and um, introduce yourself. Yeah. Can you see me? Yeah. Yes. 
Okay. So the question I had was with uh, the Dashavtar, right? Um, are you suggesting that it's more made up stories or made up to kind of explain the evolution? Yeah. Uh, yeah, can yeah. You please explain yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> for example, uh, this is a unique way of uh, telling people that the, the, the Indian education system, ancient Indi Indian education system has uh, created, that it knows that if you give just factual information, no one will remember anything. It has to be woven in the form of a story a narrative, then only you can remember any uh, technicality of it. So the Dashavatara story that we hear is actually is a uh, the origin of life, the evolution of life story, plus a story of anthropological evolution of humans joined together, which is the most significant part of to remember who we are and where we came from. For example, now we studied, uh, say, for example, uh, I'm a physicist, I studied my physics. So if I go to uh, a tribal area, some forest in say Papua New Guinea, I went there and started talking about my science, they will consider me as a crack. Which is, so I cannot give a factual information what I learned. It has to be delivered in the form of a story that they can readily accept and understand. So our Puranas is basically a, sto a narration of stories which are factual in content, scientific in content, but in given in a very uh, cultural context where people can readily accept and understand and remember forever. Okay, just to be more specific, yeah. let's say the Bhagavad Gita, right? Mm -hmm. How do we see that? Because a lot of people consider that as the sacred text for the Hindus. Yes, it is. I mean, we uh, yesterday's session talked about the corpus of uh, the Indian literature we have. So the Bhagavad Gita is kind of a culmination, we can say, which gives practical, uh, uh, I mean, you, you pr perhaps know that it was said in a, in a time of a, in a battlefield to a person who is confused by Bhagwan itself. Okay, that is just as a guide for the karma yogis. Okay, when you are when you're in the samsara in the world, when you want to do a certain action, don't get confused. So he laid down those postulates to a confused mind to entangle, the, uh, entangle that uh, confused mind. So that vision is Bhagavad Gita. Okay, so it is more of a psychological uh, counseling of a person uh, in Bhagavad Gita for karma yogis, that's specifically for karma yogis, the person who wants to do work. And there are other aspects, uh, other Puranas, other Vedas, Upavedas, and other uh, aspects, Itihasas, talk about different aspects of life. Uh, did I cover your uh, question? Or? So, yeah, just one more quick question. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so, our concept of uh, Mahavishnu and all the, uh, you know, the gods and goddesses. Yes. Are they all made up? Uh, you know, is that your, this one? Because that kind of probably, you know, kind of shakes the foundation of a lot of Hindus and their beliefs, right? Uh, no, I mean, uh, it it doesn't shake. We need just need a new perspective. That's it. It fits completely uh, perfect. We just need a new uh, uh, perspective. That's it. The point is, all the uh, the the Mahatattvas, what we call the Brahma, Vishnu, and Maheshwara, are true, but they are not in a physical form. All right, not in a form of a body. All right, not in a human form. Okay. All the, uh, all the aspects of Durga, Lakshmi, and Saraswati do exist. Ganesha and uh, Shanmukha do exist. Indras, Varunas, uh, Brihaspati do exist, but not in a constrained or not a form that people generally, how the TV serials are made. 
Okay. So there is a, the real, uh, real literature of her uh, books gives a true perspective. We have to go there and study it. For example, I'll just give you a, a notion, then I'll just finish this. For example, Mahatattva, Shiva, uh, Maheshwara, Brahma, and Vishnu. Uh, I will discuss that tomorrow. The tomorrow session is Rise of Spiritualism. This ex uh, the tomorrow session exactly talks about what the question you asked, are there true or false? They are true, but the interpretation is different. For example, the current science, okay? For example, the, uh, the physical sciences talks about loss of nature, physical and chemical loss. It does not talk about, uh, I mean, from last 10 years, they started about what, how the origin of things happen. For example, matter, how the matter is evolved, uh, originated. Before that, they were just talking about loss. Okay, law is nothing but Vishnu Tattva. Okay, and the origin of it comes to the Brahma Tattva. The matter has been created somehow by some process. But there is something beyond to it, which is the Shiva Tattva, which is invisible, but do exist. So these are the, I mean, in, from the current perspective, we can talk in this way. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you for uh, qu uh, quite uh, probing questions. It's uh, good to... Uh, Good to hear those because it's important we we understand the complexities in uh, these kind of uh, issues. I think one the, cannot underestimate the resilience of um, the ancient um, wise men, or let me put it, or the researchers, or the spiritual researchers, or the Indian scientific researchers. Um, Rishis. Who, yes, Rishis. <laughs> Rishis and uh, the kind of uh, approach that they have had always intrigues me because they had two jobs. One, find uh, the truth, the cosmic truth, and then to convey it in a way that it doesn't get dogmatic. Yeah. Unlike the, the religions that have come later on. So these two jobs, they remained, they, they still kind of try to um convey the the cosmic message um but at the same time make it as easy for people to understand as possible especially through, through the puranas so in the process i guess we being commoners we may not be able to always understand this complexity and therefore take the simple stories as true when the, con uh, the message conveyed, the essence conveyed is actually the truth, but perhaps not the stories themselves. Uh, while I won't be able to comment on um, the various, uh, for instance, I've, I've been reading Bhagavatam. There's one story in that where Narada actually says that he has uh, made this as a symbolic story for the other person to understand the pura, he calls the body as a pura, right. and then um, the eyes and uh, the indriyas and everything. Uh, there are five five snakes. Yes. <laughs> and he makes it, uh, so he makes this a very easy to understand story um, for any person to understand how the body mechanics works and how the indriyas, um, you know, uh, and how the uh, the life goes out and uh, how the old age actually kind of hits. It's uh, what comes out fascinating from that particular story is that perhaps we can understand what goes in the minds of the rishis who have written the Puranas because they understand the concept of how to convey the message through simple storytelling uh, processes. So uh, I guess to answer Kumar's uh, question, I don't think any of us know exactly the the exact um, 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 originality of uh, the characters within the stories because whether they, they really existed or didn't exist. But uh, what I call as Atma Vidya, which is Atma Vidya surely is the message we need to hold on to as uh, practitioners of Sanatana Dharma. Um, that itself is the truth, whereas the rest is left to anybody's interpretation. Uh, is what we consider important. Sir, okay. may I ask for clarification? 
Uh, yeah, sure, sure. I think, sure. I think, I think, um, uh, I now, just a minute, uh, Gauri was Shankar. saying that it oh, is a perspective. A Sorry, just a minute. Gauri Shankar's, uh, oh, yeah, he's rejoined again. Yeah, we lost him for a moment. So let him come back and then, okay. yeah. I'm sorry, I got lost. Yes. <laughs> um, sir, I have a small clarification. I want a clarification. Sure, sure. Uh, you said the present explanation is uh, a new perspective. Yeah. And it is based on certain scientific uh, uh, basis also. Yep. But many times, uh, scientific hypothesis can be nullified also. Mm -hmm. So can we, at this point of time, um, make it widespread and uh, can we? Can you try to explain the perspective of like how the sir asked you just now about Dasavatara? Mm -hmm. Can you concretely say that? Well, uh, th th that depends on how, what you consider as true or fact. Okay, for example, current science uh, modern science only takes uh, evidence-based uh, evidences as a uh, as a uh, hallmark of truth. If there is no evidence, it doesn't exist. Okay, so that's what the current science works at. But if you look at the the Yoga Sutras, for example. The Patanjali Yoga Sutra or uh, or uh, Vashishta Maharshi uh, Yoga Sutra. So the science process has explained in a different way how you can infer to the truth. It need not to be direct perception. It is one of the ways, but you need not to always look at the uh, evidence base. It could be indirect perception too. It could be inference too. Like that, there is a complete systematic study of that. How to, uh, how to uh, uh, evaluate whether a story is true or not. That's what the, the, the Nyaya Darshan, we have six Darshans. So Nyaya Darshan uh, is a systematic way created to evaluate a postulate is true or not. So the so our Indian system works on that principle. So when the Westerners say that you don't you need a evidence that I can see and I can hold on my hand, then only I'll believe. I will refute it because your experience may be true to you, but it not be a universal experience. So the Indian perspective always hold to the universal perspective. So. Uh, we can refute it, what is false, we can uh, prove it as a falsified, but the story of Dashavatara, for example, has all the components, what scientifically evidence-based science has proved today. All right, so there is no contradictions. So when there is contradictions, what is the problem believing or retelling the story of evolution as in the form of Dashavatara? Because the, the Western notion is because it comes from India or a pagan religion, they refute to believe it. Why it's so? Why? Because it doesn't have a scientific basis, you say? That's no, what you would say. That, that's what Westerners say. I won't huh. say that. I can okay. see clearly scientific basis. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, your voice is cutting. You, you are mute. I guess let's we shall we should also accept the challenge that we have in current times, which is that uh, it is a lot of it is evidence based. Uh, the burden is on uh, us to really kind of demonstrate the existence of something. But yes. that is where that is where I hope the historians of uh, modern times, particularly from India, value not the evidence but the consistency in narrations. Yes. So that makes it a lot more logical kind of proposition in how we investigate and uh, how we propose uh, theories and uh, uh, such. So there is internal consistency and intra consistency. So internal consistency is within one particular text, one particular scripture. If there are a lot of contradictions, then it obviously goes against. So this is one of the challenges, I think, in uh, some of the modern uh, religions where there are a lot of internal inconsistencies. Um, 
So for us, we don't have that uh, challenge because one, the internal consistency exists. And then in between the Shastras, if there is intra-consistency, so that also helps. So we are looking at consistencies across perhaps time zones as in uh, um, eras, between eras, and then also even if it is within the same era. So the more we have such volume of uh, evidence, the more robust our uh, case would be to propose what we uh, believe to be true. Anyway, things are very thought provoking. We need to think a lot about it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, so let's draw it to a close. Um, so it's already quite 840. 40, yeah. So tomorrow, what's the topic, uh, Gauri Shankar? Tomorrow is a topic called Rays of Spiritualism. Okay. Uh, what Kumar, Ji said, uh, Kumar Garu just said, the, the devas, is it true or false? The, the story of iconography created in India. How, okay. what it represents and, uh, and the story around it. So Okay, perfect. Thank you. So we'll meet again at 7 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you once again. See you. Namaste. Namaskar. Shubharatri. Thank you. Thank you so much.